The public theaters of Shakespeare's time were very different buildings from our theaters today. First of all, they were open-air playhouses. As recent excavations of the rows and the globe confirm, some were polygonal or roughly circular in shape. The fortune, however, was square. The most recent estimates of their size put the diameter of these buildings at 72 feet, the rows to 100 feet, the globe, but they were said to hold vast audiences of two or 3,000 who must have been squeezed together quite tightly. Some of these spectators paid extra to sit or stand in the two or three levels of roofed galleries that extended on the upper levels all the way around the theater and surrounded an open space. In this space were the stage and perhaps the tiring house. What would we what we would call dressing rooms as well as the so-called yard. In the yard stood the spectators who chose to pay less, the ones whom Hamlet contemptuously called groundlings. For roof, they had only the sky, and so they were exposed to all kinds of weather. They stood on a floor that was sometimes made of mortar and sometimes of ash mixed with the shells of hazelnuts. The latter provided a porous and therefore dry footing for the crowd, and the shells may have been more comfortable to stand on because they were not as hard as mortar. Availability of shells may not have been a problem if hazelnuts were a favorite food for Shakespeare's audiences to munch on as they watched his plays. Archaeologists who are today unearthing the remains of theaters from this period have discovered quantities of these nutshells on theater sites. Unlike the yard, the stage itself was covered by a roof. Its ceiling, called the heavens, is thought to have been elaborately painted to depict the sun, moon, stars, and planets. Just how big the stage was remains hard to determine. We have a single sketch of part of the interior of the Swan. A Dutchman named Johannes de Witt visited this theater around 1596 and sent a sketch of it back to his friend Arend van Buschel. Because Van Buschel found DeWitt's letter and sketch of interest, he copied both into a book. It is Van Buschel's copy, adapted, it seems, to the shape and size of the page in his book that survives. In his sketch, the stage appears to be a large rectangular platform that thrusts far out into the yard, perhaps even as far as the center of the circle formed by the surrounding galleries. This drawing, combined with the specifications for the size of the stage and the Building contract for the fortune has led scholars to conjecture that the stage on which Shakespeare's plays were performed must have measured approximately 43 feet in width and 27 feet in depth, a vast acting area. But the digging up of a large part of the rows by archaeologists uh, provided evidence of a quite different stage design. The rose stage was a the rose stage was a platform tapered at the corners and much and much shallower than what seems to be depicted in the Van Buschel sketch. Indeed, its measurements seem to be about 37.5 feet across at its widest point and only 15.5 feet deep, because the surviving indications of stage size and design differ from each other so much. It is possible that the stages in other playhouses like the theater, the curtain, the curtain, and the globe, the outdoor playhouses where Shakespeare's plays were performed, were different from those at both the Swan and the Rose. After about 1608, Shakespeare's plays were staged not only at the globe, but also at an indoor or private playhouse in Blackfriars. This theater had been constructed in 1596 by James Burbage in an upper hall of a former Dominican priori, priori or monastic house. Although Henry VIII had dissolved all English monasteries in the 1530s shortly after he had founded the Church of England, the area remained under church rather than holistic, hostile civic control. The hall that Burbage had purchased and renovated was a large one in which Parliament had once met. In the private theater that he constructed, the stage lit by candles was built across the narrow end of the hall. With boxes flanking it, the rest of the hall offered seating real room only. Because there was no provision for standing room, the largest audience it could hold was less than a thousand or about a quarter of what the globe could accommodate. 
admission to Blackfriars was correspondingly more expensive. Instead of a penny to stand in the yard at the Globe, it cost a minimum of six pence to get into the Blackfriars. The best seats at the Globe in the Lord's Room in the gallery above and behind the stage cost six pence, but the boxes flanking the stage at Blackfriars were half a crown, or five, six, five times six pence. Some spectators who were particularly interested in displaying themselves paid even more to sit on stools on the Blackfriars stage. <laughs>